300 million people are at risk of coastal flooding in about 30 years as sea levels rise. Now that's nearly three times as many people previously thought. And the bulk of those at risk live here in Asia. Those results of new research by a US-based climate organization, Climate Central, which says previous numbers were far too optimistic. And more on our top story, we're joined by Professor Benjamin Horton from the Asian School of the Environment at Nanyang Technological University. Ben, thanks for coming in. Good evening. Uh, it does feel like quite a big reality check uh, with these numbers or with this latest report. Help us understand uh, how the numbers have tripled to 300 million. Well, when you're considering sea level rise, you on the one hand have to consider what's happening in the oceans. Mm. And there's been much research about the increase in ocean temperatures and increase in ocean volume and the melting of our ice sheets. But sea level rise is also influenced by what is happening to the land. Mm. And so this study corrects a bias in old data on actually calculating the elevation of the land with respect to the ocean level. Okay, but the report also says that most of the affected people are here in Asia. You know, it says here China, India, Bangladesh and Vietnam. Why is that the case? Well, two aspects. One is that there's a high population density in Asia and Southeast Asia and they're very exposed. They're living on low-lying coastal lands. But then when you think about sea level rise, it's a very, very complicated problem. Yes, you have to understand the oceans, but you also have to understand the land. And there are very many processes which make Asia very, very susceptible. We could pick Jakarta, for example. Jakarta, the land is sinking at some 20 centimetres per year because groundwater is being withdrawn for industrial and commercial use. We have areas such as Bangkok and the other mega Asian cities that are lying on deltas. Deltas, the land is sinking. So again, it's more susceptible to sea level rise. The tropics in general is a hot spot for sea level rise in the 21st century. So what sort of impact will populations face then? The, the, are people going to have to, be, to move, to relocate? Well, when you look about sea level rise, even in the smallest amounts, they can have devastating effects. They can contaminate your freshwater aquifers, therefore influencing drinking water. They can contaminate your agricultural fields and therefore affecting food security. They also make storms of a greater magnitude and they go further inland, so we can have destruction in that way. So then the question is, what do you do about it? And there are basically three mechanisms. First of all, you can stop the water coming in by building seawalls, polders, dikes, etc. Second of all, you can allow the water to live within you and you can have an urban city that's more in tune with the waterways. Or thirdly, you can move away. And for an island such as Singapore, the third option isn't there. So we need to think about adequately preparing our shorelines. All right. So, you know, we've, we've talked about Singapore. We know that, you know, Singapore is you know, trying to do everything possible. But what about the other nations that, that, you know, this report has now shown that they're going to be, you know, completely wiped out in certain parts? Are they adequately prepared for this? Well, obviously, a developing nation is going to be more pre uh, less prepared than a developed nation such as Singapore. But when we think about sea level rise, I, I personally don't think it matters whether you're rich or poor, black or white. If you don't do anything about the root cause of climate change, which is greenhouse gas emissions, then the changes in sea level will be so very, very severe that it doesn't matter what adaptation practices you use. So we must reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and then the adaptation policies that would be developed in the developed world could be transferred to other countries and therefore you could keep on having a, a flourishing ecosystem and a vibrant um, economy. Well you mentioned carbon emissions. The report suggests that areas will be flooded whether or not we cut mm. carbon emissions. Do you share that view? Well the one thing to think about to do with climate change is we've already set the wheels in motion. We started burning fossil fuels at the beginning of the industrial revolution in the 1880s. And so our climate is already changing and it will continue to change. The question we now have as a society is do we want to keep this to a manageable level or do we want to create a climate emergency? I want to pick up on the, what you mentioned. That doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor for these countries, but you know the poorer countries will argue that they need every resources available to them to just basically survive, and so therefore they're going to do whatever they can. And carbon emissions basically not top on their agenda. Well, of course they have differing agendas, and that's why we have the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement was made by all countries to try and keep our carbon dioxide emissions peaking in, thir uh, in, in about 11 years in 2030, and then decreasing thereafter. 
The other aspect of the Paris Agreement that is not so readily disclosed is the transfer of money and assets and carbon credits from the developed regions to the developing regions. So they can still prosper and, and make their way out of poverty, but not at the expense of the whole of the planet. Right. Indeed, so some very sobering thoughts here on um, you know, climate change. But thank you so much for coming in and um, you know, shedding and helping us understand more. We've been speaking to Professor Benjamin Horton from the Asian School of Environment at Nanyang Technological University. University.